genetic diversity or plants that aren't in sync with our um, other biota and the other organisms that live with plants, those, those are a problem. Those, are, those things are problems. And that's why we try to continue to educate people about native plants. I like all plants. I have other types of plants in my gardens at home. The nursery grows non-native plants as well. We try to be very careful about which ones those are. But when we're talking about certain environmental uh, projects or certain environmental approaches to landscaping, I think it becomes much more important at that point to work with natives. And I don't know how many of you have been to Charlevoix, Michigan, but the reason I use this as an intro for this talk is because every community that I've ever been to that, that is on a lake, whether it's Skinny Atlas or, or Watkins Glen or Charlevoix, Michigan, or any, any town in the country or in the world that's on a lake or on a body of water, that body of water becomes part of the identity of the community and of the people. And this is just a series of murals on the sidewalk in Charlevoix, Michigan, but you can see in these murals how Lake Michigan in that case has become part of the town and the town has become part of the lake. Let's see. All right. There we go. All right, so lake friendly landscaping with native plants. Basically the why, um, there are a lot of reasons why, but one of the things that I think is most important for people to remember is that one reason why is for the plants themselves. We often think of plants as a vehicle to help other organisms and particularly for pollinators. And that's great. But we also wanna remember that the plants themselves have inherent value. And if we start to omit them from landscapes or forget about them or overlook them, then a lot of things fall apart. So I have to remember that the plants are an integral part of native plant landscaping. And it's not just for hummingbirds and butterflies. But it's for all these other reasons too. I won't read through them. I know you can all read the text in these. There's also a where component. So where do we do lake friendly landscaping? It's not just along shorelines. It's not just stream banks. It includes those places, but it also includes farmland and meadows and upland habitats. It, it includes residential landscapes. It includes parking lot landscapes, landscapes of businesses, uh, waste lots and urban areas. These are all places where lake friendly landscaping works and where all types of native landscaping are relevant and important. And then how we do it, essentially we're taking, in this model, we're taking native plants and putting them into a land, any landscape where something else might have been planted. So where somebody might've planted forsythias or somebody might've planted um, hostas, we're common landscape plants. We're now saying, let's put something else in their place. Let's use native plants. But we're also trying to mimic nature. We're trying to preserve and conserve biodiversity, which is in the genetics of these plants, where they grow and where they live. And we're trying to accomplish certain goals that are in the why section, such as um, we're trying to stabilize soils, we're trying to eliminate runoffs, we're trying to reestablish healthy plant communities where all of us live, including animals and human beings. And the reason I say that we're in management mode now is because whether we like it or not, our um, scale of disturbance it, where we live all over the world and particularly at home where we see it, um, forces us to be in management mode, whether we like it or not. It, it's nice to say that we can leave certain natural areas alone and pristine, but um, I don't think that that's often quite realistic anymore with invasive species kind of running amok in so many natural areas. So we kind of have to deal with some form of management and intentional processes. And that's really what landscaping is. So I'm gonna show you a few natural Nature's examples of what plant communities look like and what healthy native landscapes look like in the wild. These are not built, these are not created, these are discovered in the wild in common places right around us here in the Finger Lakes. This is between Lansing and Groton. And this is just to show you what a dense, layered, textured, diverse native plant landscape looks like. This does not mean that this is exactly what we would recommend for somebody's front yard. But it does mean that if someone comes to us and says they want to do some kind of lakeshore buffer or a border planting on a back part of their property or a habitat planting somewhere, you can take components 
and you can take ideas from these natural landscapes and apply them. You can take the plants that you think are the most beautiful. You can take the plants that behave the best and have the best shape and apply those into landscape situations. But one of the most important things is to look at the density of healthy native landscapes layered together. Sugar maples and gray dogwoods layered on top of each other. Here we have a roadside ditch. And what makes this roadside ditch so rich and important in this case is simply that it hasn't been destroyed yet. This is just an open, wild roadside ditch that probably has almost a dozen species of native plants growing in it. And this ditch on, on the left of this photo is a, far, is a farm field. And on the right, of course, is the road. Lots of runoff and runoff in both directions from farm fields and from the roadway. And here's a, here's, a, here's a beautiful little native landscape functioning on its own just because it hasn't been disturbed and destroyed. But again, it's a model. And I'll show you what this model can um, be an example of in, in contrast to what we normally see in roadside ditches here, okay? So this is how human beings generally approach roadside ditches. This is how nature approaches roadside ditches. Now, I'm not trying to make people out to be the bad guy here, but what we, what we are trying to do is show people examples of how we may be mismanaging these situations and how easy it can be to just go out and look at a healthy option or a healthy alternative that exists in nature, kind of a dime a dozen out in the wild. Um, and of course, the photo on the right is just showing you the conveyance of sediment in water that is headed right down to Cuga Lake. And on the left is a photo that I just took yesterday where I walk back on some of the farmland behind us where someone has cleared to open it up. And the idea with clearing around a stream in that case is, that, is the thought that vegetation inhibits drainage from the field by somehow holding the water back, but it really doesn't. It's just that vegetation stabilizes the soil and provides habitat. And now that's gone for a while on the left, and on the photo on the right, it's probably gone for a long time because that's a, that's a mode of management in that case, which obviously we wouldn't recommend. So one of these concepts that is illustrated in native plant communities all the time is how plants share time and space. So they, they share space sometimes by alternating timings in the wild, and sometimes they just cram themselves in together five and six deep. So on the left, you have marsh marigold growing with a bunch of plants underneath it as well, some native and some not. And then above the marsh marigold, you have silky dogwood, very common native plants showing us how, giving us models, showing us how we can create native landscapes in wet areas without worrying about are the plants too close together, without worrying about how far apart we should plant and how much mulch to use. All those questions that we have with landscaping, we look out at nature, we see how it works there. And then on the right, you see a photo showing uh, a native wetland in the early spring with sedges and marsh marigolds and last year's fern uh, forefronds still, still up. And then this is what the same landscape looks like in the summer when the spring plants are finished with the reproductive cycle. They're done flowering and sometimes even go a little bit dormant anyway in the summer. And then the summer plants in the same space take over and those are a bunch of native fern species in the same swamp. So that's what I call a timeshare concept and it's very important to apply that to landscapes of all kinds. Here's just one more example showing you um, an, in, in nature, if anybody has seen or tried to grow Clethra ulnifolia, a very common popular native shrub in the mid-Atlantic, and once you learn it, you love it and you wanna plant it everywhere. So we try to plant it up here. It doesn't really like to grow here. It never does this. That's Clethra in the top left. And when you try to grow it here, it's usually a sort of a sad shrub that limps along forever and never does too much. It likes acidic soils and it likes sand and it can handle water as long as it's in sand. This is a tidal brackish situation in central New Jersey. But again, sedges, growing inside Clethra in this case. And that's the way this landscape is throughout. It's layered four or five different plants deep every, everywhere you look. And that's just how it works in the wild. Now, when we are talking about lake-friendly landscaping, 
which I will say broadly, I like to think of it as native landscaping, but there's there's differences between the two. But this is the municipal approach, the agency approach, and it's been the municipal agency approach for decades. And it's not bad, but it's not always practical or, or applicable to someone who owns a quarter acre lot or someone who owns a two acre parcel. It's really sometimes unattainable and hard to relate to. At, at the smaller scale, but I wanted to show you a few examples of some municipal restoration lake friendly landscape concepts here. Uh, and these few pictures here are from a friend, Lydia Brinkley, who is the Upper Susquehanna, I'm going to forget, it's a very long acronym, but it's the Upper Susquehanna, I want to say watershed uh, district. That's not exactly the right name, but some of you probably know Lydia, and if anyone does, you could put her name into the chat or the Q&A. Um, and Lydia does lots of really cool large-scale restoration projects, and she was a speaker at our symposium just a couple months ago. This is one of her projects, and I believe what you're looking at there is a lot of knotweed and other weeds in the management stage, and then post-planting, and a lot of times all you'll see are tree tubes and tree shelters in the first year because these projects are woefully underfunded, and they have to use little plants. And it's one of the problems with these projects is we're always using small plants and crossing our fingers that they survive. Here's another example, a little more terrestrial, just a stream winding through some farmland. This is another one of Lydia's projects, but you can see little pink flags all over the landscape there. Those are uh, plant sites. This, this photo is a little bit overcolored because I wanted you to be able to see all the tree tubes, which wasn't showing up before. Um, but this is how these projects go. Large swaths of land are put aside by a farmer or some sort of landowner. Sometimes it's public land, sometimes it's private land. And there's usually grant money that's associated with these plantings, but of course the money doesn't go as far as everyone would like. Plants are small, maintenance is very limited. If we have a dry summer or a couple dry summers, the plants take a, take a hit. It's a tough way to accomplish successful restoration. You generally need volunteer help. Sometimes that's a mix of community members. Uh, sometimes it's youth groups. These are sort of pulled together a lot of times. It's grunt work, <coughs> excuse me, it's heavy work. It's fun, but it's not easy. So that's just to give you a quick example of how sort of the municipal agency approach works for lake friendly landscaping. And I should say that a lot of those projects I just showed you are really all about keeping waterways clean and restoring a healthy native plant buffer along waterways that feed lakes, rivers, and eventually the ocean. So I'm just gonna give you a, a sample project that we were involved with last year. And this one is in, as you can see by the map, the Finger Lakes region. And we're gonna zoom in. Uh, I'm sure everyone can tell where that is right now. So now uh, we're zooming in towards Ithaca and Lansing. This was a Tompkins County project with the town of Lansing and we did a bunch of tree planting and shrub planting. And so here now we're looking at Ludlowville and I've just put in red outline, I've put the, um, the, sa the Salmon Creek course outlined and in the upper inch or so of that photo, you can see a nice healthy uh, sort of meander of the stream channel. And then you can sort of see a dark green swath that's the floodplain that runs down in this photo until it hits Ludlowville where it goes through a series of well-known waterfalls and eventually to the lake. And then zooming in one more time, here's the project site in red. And a couple of things I want you to notice from this photo before I show you some pictures afterward is one, you can see that the, oops, that was, um, my daughter warned me this is a touch screen, I forgot. Um, that is the first uh, meander or oxbow in this creek is about to undermine the farm property in the photo. And then the second one is about to undermine the roadway. Now, people can have their opinions on what should or should not happen on a project like this, but we came into it after all the decisions were long made and we were just asked to come in and do some planting. So what's important in this photo as well is in the larger rectangle that's just left of center in the photo, you can see a very well-established 
dense riparian forest inside the red line. And I want you to pay attention in the photos to see what that looks like after the project. Now, this is just giving you a look about a quarter mile upstream, showing you a healthy riparian forest corridor, sycamores lining the, the creek, and then a mixed diverse forest above it with pines, maples, beeches, hickories, oaks. It's a really rich, diverse forest there. And then farmland, obviously, in the foreground. And then as we move to our left in this view, what you're seeing in this photo is the very beginning of the disturbed area. So we're looking now upstream at the, at the uh, established riparian forest. And then standing where the photo is taken from is the beginning of the project site where everything was pretty much stripped out and the stream channel was re-engineered to take a slightly different shape. And in the process, all the mature trees were lost. So that's what we were dealing with and that's what we were trying to replant for. So you're right at that transition point there. Now these photos really are just to show you in the background how empty the vegetation is. These two tree planted tree plantings are in that area I mentioned with the red line. So those two trees are now growing right in the middle of that red uh, rectangle-ish area where it used to be densely forested. So they have their work cut out for them. They don't have the natural cover and shade that a forest provides its new seedlings and none of the stability that's provided by thousands of plants that were holding all the soil. So this is a brand new site. It's a built site. And these trees, these are photos I took two days ago. So these trees are waking up happy right now, but they have a long way to go. A lot of open space, which creates vulnerability. So just a couple of things to show you on a site like this. <clears throat> These cages were put on a year after. This was a phase one, a very small planting we did a couple of years ago on this site. And they didn't even really have a budget for tree cages or deer, deer protection. So these were put on a year after the planting in that case. And most of the plants in there are okay. But what this photo is really to show is the rack line on the right, which is where the debris has overtopped the first terrace of stone but the second terrace of stone has held up and I don't think any water has gone above that. Those terraces allow the energy during a storm to dissipate. The water gets above the terrace and flattens out. These are like miniature built-in floodplain terraces is the design idea with those. But you can see all the open space and it's a tough site. In this photo, you get a better look at the rack line on the outside curve of the stream channel. The water moves faster on the outside and has more energy. And on the inside of the stream channel, it's quieter and calmer. And that's why you get these point bars that develop over time, because at the point bar where the top arrow is, the water moves more slowly. So sediment starts to drop out of the water. And that's what creates those point bars. And on those point bars, birches, cottonwoods, maples, dogwoods start to grow naturally on their own, early successional species. In this case, you're looking at a built point bar. It hasn't had time yet to see lots of good things grow in on it. And so it's a race against time, all the weeds that wanna grow there. That's really the problem with some of these kinds of sites. And this is just giving you a quick look at who's on site. Japanese knotweed, I kind of overcolored it in red to show you how it's starting to come back on this site. Japanese knotweed on the left. And then in the upper part of that photo, you'll see some trees planted. And then on the right, just the usuals, um, you know, burdock, thistles, garlic mustard, all the usual suspects. And then of course, deer browse. Some plants, as soon as they escape the cage profile, they do get browse. Not all of them, but some do. So this is just a, a, a big scale type of project. And these projects get costly and they can be very hard to maintain and manage after planting. And that's really been the nemesis of this model of Lake friendly landscaping and restoration. And it's one of the reasons that I have enjoyed working more at the residential scale, applying those same principles to the residential landscape. And that's really what the next part of this presentation will show you is just a few examples of how we take those principles, those same concepts with layering and density and finding the right plants and matching the right plants to the right places, the habitats where they wanna grow, all these basic concepts, applying them to the residential landscape 
Um, this is a property that we've worked on for several years, but we haven't really done much to this landscape in a long time. Uh, the client asked us to plant elderberries to screen the property behind her, and I would have never thought to do that. And she was actually one of our first clients to really embrace some of these ideas. And this landscape is kind of a chaotic swarm of native species now. This photo is taken a few years ago. And these plants are fighting it out, but there's no space on the ground available for invasive species and for weeds. This backyard is a haven for pollinators and all kinds of fun critters. And it is highly diverse, doesn't require much maintenance in the form of watering or anything like that. None of the usual maintenance. The only maintenance, maintenance is occasionally managing the balance of species in here. So sometimes we thin some things out. Here's another, just, just another example. There, there are a couple of plants in that photo that I almost, um, that I don't like to show. And so I almost didn't include this photo, but what, what I wanted to show here is the way that we can apply these same principles in a dry site, in an upland site. Uh, these are grasses and drought tolerant perennials. There were some uh, non-native grasses, miscanthus, which is now on New York State's do not plant list um, that were still in this landscape. But mostly what we added were a wide range of perennial drought tolerant native perennials, amsonias, penstemons, mountain mint, monardas, things like that, asclepias. Um, so, so these same principles work in all types of sites. And this is how that planting went in. The machine there is just a little walk behind sod cutter that carved out the lawn. And then we just were putting in small containers. And that's a couple, maybe two to three years later, the, up, the upper photos. So you know, there's not a lot of um, secret sauce that goes into making these landscapes work other than making sure we have the right plants that are suitable for the conditions. That's really the basic concept in all of these landscapes. If it's a wet site, you got to use wet site plants. If it's a dry site, vice versa. Whereas in traditional landscaping, and this is important to point out, in traditional landscaping, the decision making parameters have usually been what colors do we like, or what size plants do we want, or do we want evergreen or deciduous, and those are all fine. But if we're trying to work in a different way, in a different form and using different paradigm for different types of landscapes, then it really comes down to let's first make sure we're using plants that like to grow in the conditions of the site. That's primary importance right there. And then among those plants, pick the prettiest ones and pick the ones you like the most, but first has to be making sure we're matching the right plants to the site. And unfortunately, most garden centers really don't have that information for you, and that's part of the problem. So this is just an example right on a pond shore when the water level was up, this would be sort of mucky and swampy. Um, this site had been kind of destroyed by a, a piece of heavy equipment, a, an excavator went in there to put in a, a, a dike and made a mess of the property, and the client was really sad to see her pond had been kind of uh, ravaged like that. So she just asked us to do something. What could we do? So keep keep your eye on those sort of wooden stakes that are out at the end of the dike there. And you'll see them for reference in the photo, in the photos. <clears throat> she had an old pile of rotten composted mulch about 100 yards from where we would be doing this. So we just used what she had there to kind of level it out and provide a little bit of organic matter. It was not something we probably would have even done if it hadn't have been on the property already, but it was a nice way to make that pile go away and put it to good use. And you can see two gallon containers, one gallon containers, nothing crazy in terms of scale or crazy costs on a project like this. And this is uh, just in the upper left, you can see those same stakes kind of getting swallowed up by some of the sedges and grasses. There's uh, swamp milkweed, elderberry. We planted just kind of maybe eight species in here, 10 species at the most, but that's a year after, and this is the second year after, looking backwards, standing on the dike, looking back at the same spot. So you can see there's marsh marigold we planted there, we planted ferns in there, sometimes sedges and rushes. Sometimes the approach is let's plant 12 species and hope that eight of them do well, or let's plant 30 species and hope that 20 of them survive. Uh, often on these kind of projects, you will find that a few species really love it 
and it's not always predictable, but let them do the work, let them spread out. If a couple of other species struggle and fade away on the site, that's okay. That happens out, out there too. So we're trying to apply as much as as much information as we have to the site and let the plants fight it out once they're there. Here's another um, form of lake friendly landscaping, which is the rain garden. And the rain garden has been made too complicated in my opinion. A lot of times people think that a rain garden has to be a built site where we take all the runoff from a house and we have to orchestrate this with the drainage and we have to run the drainage out to the rain garden. We have to do some digging with heavy equipment and all that. It doesn't have to be that way. Most properties around here already have parts of their property that are too wet. And if you have a part of your property that's too wet, which can just be low wet lawn, that's your rain garden. And you just dig out that grass or bury it with cardboard and mulch for a season and then plant those plants that want to be in wet soils. And that is your rain garden. Your drainage is probably already headed there anyway if that's the wet part of your property. So the idea of directing house drainage to a spot in order to create a rain garden is something that comes from drier climates or drier habitats, drier soils. We don't really have that problem in most of our region. So here's just a look at this rain garden that is establishing over the course of maybe first year. This is early the first season after planting. So second year, but one year after planting. These are um, Senecio aureus, which is called groundsel or golden ragwort. And this plant is just an early bloomer that we like to use. It's a spreader, it grows in sort of damp woods and it's just a cheerful spring native species. Here's what that site's looking like in the third year with irises, chokeberries, marsh marigolds, sedges, ferns. This rain garden, we were given free rain as sort of like a trial to, I think we planted maybe 30 species in here, which is probably a little bit more than was necessary, but it was a really fun trial planting. And this is what it looked like three years later. No, I'm just kidding. This is the alternative that I wanted to share with you because a project like this is a different landscape from a project like this. And this is what is our paradigm in our time of, and place in history. This is kind of the paradigm for landscaping. And, you know, I don't really hate it. I just think that, uh, it's this particular one isn't that exciting. Um, I, I like traditional landscapes, I like formal landscapes, but again, if we're talking about this type of scenario and we're talking about something different, then this type of result is may not be for everyone and it's certainly not for every situation, but this is how you sponge up water in a rain garden. This is how you create biodiversity in the landscape. This is how you pull pollinators into the garden this is how you make sure that whatever's running off from the road above this landscape doesn't end up in the pond. This is what those things look like. Again, this was probably a little bit of a crazy mess that didn't have to be so wild. And some of that is client taste. In the foreground, you'd see um, uh, blue lobelia, lobelia syphilitica, and also the pink in the top center is spirea tomentosa, our native spirea, which likes to grow in wet soils. There's all kinds of stuff in there, turtle head. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a uh, run through on a few other things. I could show you pictures of landscapes over and over, but I wanted to make sure we have time to highlight what I consider to be some of my favorite bulletproof, universally reliable native species. Um, and we'll go through these, there's just a handful of them, and then we'll show you a few nursery photos to give you some other ideas about steps in the process for how you get from the beginning to a successful planting. Uh, so one of my favorite shrubs of really all of North America is gray dogwood, Cornus racemosa. Um, Cornus racemosa is a little bit of a shape shifter. Sometimes it makes long running thickets that can be 50 feet long. And sometimes it just shows up as a tall spindly plant in the deep shade. Sometimes it grows in saturated muck soils and sometimes it grows on road cuts that don't see any moisture for months. So 
it's really almost too good to be true that this plant will literally just about grow anywhere. Uh, it's relatively deer proof in that it may get browsed, but it doesn't get hammered by the deer and it tends to grow faster than the deer will ever try to um, nip it. So it's not the kind of plant that's gonna get ruined by deer browse. And in a lot of landscapes, it doesn't even really get eaten at all. It's got very dense hard wood. It can be slow growing in the nursery in the beginning. So often we have small ones in the nursery and we're always trying to raise these into bigger and bigger container plants because it's really satisfying to see a big three foot high multi-stemmed gray dogwood in a container. That's what we want to see, something big. But we plant these out small too and they do fine. And in the types of projects that I showed you earlier, agency scale projects, restoration projects, um, these can often be planted in little containers like this size um, or smaller plug sizes. And they do fine. You build in mortality to the plan when you're using really small plants or little bare root seedlings. That's part of the budget and part of the plan on those projects is if they plant a thousand plants, they're hoping 400 or 600 might survive. Smaller scale in the landscape, we expect like 99% survival. There's really no reason plants should die if we're using the right ones. So just a couple more plants that um, fall into this category of universal, rewarding, fast growing, successful plants. The silky dogwood, and I promise I'm not just gonna show you dogwoods, but it, when we think of characteristic shrubs for central New York, dogwood is up there as in terms of abundance and, and diversity. We have several species up here. We see them everywhere. They grow in various habitats. We have a lot of shrub dogwoods. They're great plants. This is silky dogwood. It does have burgundy red stems. It's not quite as cherry red as the um, red twig dogwood, but it's close. And I didn't show a photo of that, but um, it's a fast growing, vigorous, big uh, version of the red twig dogwood in many ways. And the, everyone loves the red twig dogwood, but red twig dogwood is much more deer prone than silky. Silky dogwood seems to be another shrub that can outgrow deer pressure and doesn't get eaten as much in the first place. So we tend to use this one quite a bit more. Um, and it'll grow in wet or dry conditions. It doesn't have that grow anywhere tendency. It's not gonna grow in full shade, but these plants will take part shade. They'll take saturated water, water's edge or relatively dry, very fast growing plant. We grow these in the nursery and we love them. Nine bark. I think a lot of people know nine barks as the purple cultivar and the yellow cultivars that have been in the trade for a while. Um, I think we'll talk, let's see, I'm just trying to think if I want to mention cultivars a little later, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little something about them now quickly. Cultivars are selections of a plant. Once that selection is made, and it's a selection for something specific, maybe it's a different color, a leaf color, maybe it's a dwarf form, maybe it is something that has double flowers. Once that selection is made, the only way to preserve that trait is to grow the plant by cloning it vegetatively. So we, at that point, we no longer allow for sexual reproduction in these plants if, if we're working with a cultivar. Now, that may not really concern anyone. However, um, at that point, you no longer have the basic functioning process of genetic diversity going on, which is sexual reproduction. So now we're cloning those plants. So when you go to a garden center and, garden center and see um, the red chokeberry cultivar called Brilliantissima, those are all grown by clone now. Those are, those are used, grown by cutting or tissue culture. So we're no longer getting genetic diversity when we plant those plants out in the landscape. Every single Ar Aronia brilliantissima is the same exact genome, the same DNA. When we grow plants from seed, we're participating in the healthy mixing of genetic material within the region. So we're participating in allowing the plants to participate in sexual reproduction, which keeps the gene pool healthy and functioning. And remember that it's the gene pool that allows plants to respond to things like climate change. The biggest thing that plants will have to deal with 
other than just dying on any given day from deer pressure or something else is climate change. And if anything is going to help plants deal with climate change, it's the depth of their gene pool. That's where it comes from. It comes from sexual reproduction. That's why we grow plants from seed. And that's why we don't really like to see native plants grown from as cultivars, because cultivars are always genetically identical to each other. Nine barks are a typical, typically a green shrub, green leaf shrub. And in the trade, they are known, in the nursery trade, they're known by a lot of colorful cultivars, purple leaves, yellow leaves. So that's why I bring that up here. Uh, nine bark is almost as universal as the gray dogwood. It will grow in shade, full sun, super dry, rocky cliff edges and banks, or in pretty damp soils down by the water's edge. It'll grow just about anywhere. Tough shrub, fast growing, not generally considered everybody's most favorite beautiful shrub. But once you start asking native plants to grow in really difficult sites, it becomes a lot more beautiful when they work. And the nine bark is a plant that was doing very well on the site I just showed you some pictures of that we planted last year. But I didn't take pictures of the nine bark because they didn't really come out that well on, uh, in the light. They just didn't, they were harder to see. But here's just to give you an idea, they do flower and they are fairly showy in bloom. And then their seed heads are fairly showy. Um, but to me, the nine bark is a useful plant when you need a plant that will perform erosion control, uh, density, cover, birds love the seed. So it's a useful functioning plant and I recommend you use it. Another one of our favorites, and we get this question all the time, which is, you guys grow sumac? Why do you grow it? Um, we grow it, and, and the answer I like to give people, the short version is because birds eat sumac fruit in the June after, the year after the plants flowered. So there are still birds today, right now today, eating last year's sumac fruit. This plant flowered in the summer of 2020, and it's still feeding birds today in May of 2021. That's amazing. There's no other plant that really does that. And the sumacs will hold their fruit into June and they'll feed birds all through June until there's new fruit and new seed on this year's crops of all other plants that can feed the birds. So that's the easy reason to say why we wanna grow sumac, but also when we're talking about tough sites where we're just desperate to get something that we'll wanna grow, something that will outcompete invasive species, something that will deal with harsh rocky soils, something that will deal with no, ma no maintenance, no care, no watering. That list is very short. And at the top of that list are the sumacs. And this is our native staghorn sumac. It's a beautiful flowering shrub. Again, would I recommend that somebody use this in their front landscape? No, but if someone has a few acres and is trying to develop part of their property for habitat, that's where this shrub belongs. And of course, on municipal scale projects, absolutely, that's where it belongs. In places where sumac grows, if we don't have sumac, we're gonna have large scale weed problems. We're gonna have large scale shrub weeds and tree weeds. And that's one of the reasons that we need these large scale native species. But you can see in the bottom, that's a photo taken, of course, with in midwinter with snow on, snow on the sumac. And then there's the individual fruit that shapes up late in the season. Uh, it's uh, the, the inflorescence that shapes up with little seeds all over it um, that persist into next year. Another one that is a little easier to interest people in growing in most home landscapes, although in my opinion, I, I would uh, probably grow gray dogwood in the landscape almost before I grow elderberry. Elderberry is a great plant. I love elderberries. I love them all. but it is a little bit hard to work into a landscape because it gets so large and rangy and it goes in different directions. You know, one trunk will go this way and another trunk will go this way and those will branch off and eventually sort of lean over a little bit. It's a very range, can be a rangy shrub. It can also be pruned ruthlessly down to any size you want and it'll just get nice and full and you may have to prune it again in a couple of years, but it's very fast growing. I think most people know the elderberries like sort of those sunny, wet spots, farm fields, ditches, roadsides, uh, but they'll pretty much grow wherever you put them other than full shade or bone dry conditions. So they're a very versatile plant in the landscape. Massive, massive source of flowers and fruit for birds. And of course, for 
flowers, pollinators are all over the elderberry. Um, high, highly diverse group of pollinators that will visit flowers like this in these umbels, where you have lots of tiny little flowers in, congested into a head, like you see in the top right photo. So that's really what the elderberry does so wonderfully for the fauna where it lives. And because it's a fast grower and likes to grow near waterways or in open areas of, that are wet, it's a great stabilizer. We use it on banks whenever we can. I've planted some on our property on a creek bank, and it's one of the few plants that has held up back there with the disturbance of a rushing creek bank. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about birches, and in particular, one of my favorite trees, which is the gray birch. Now, a lot of us know the birches as river birch, if we know a native birch. Um, before the river birch became a popular landscape tree in North America, most people knew European and Asian birches in the landscape. And they didn't live very long and they suffered from disease and trunks would collapse, which wasn't a big deal except they just didn't last long. Um, and they were disease prone and died a lot. That was sort of the, the, the uh, reputation that those birches had. So then the river birch became a popular birch in landscapes and river birch uh, is a great tree, it's beautiful. It's got that peeling sort of cinnamon colored bark and it's a wetland tree and a floodplain tree that's actually native in New York state, but um, not abundant. We don't see it around here. It's not really in the Finger Lakes. Our abundant little native um, birch of wetlands all over the Northeast, one of the species is the gray birch. And gray birch is in Tompkins County. It's in the Finger Lakes. It's also all over the Northeast and the Eastern US and it will grow in shady swamps, and it will grow on road, crop, road cuts on highways. So this is a birch, like the, like the gray dogwood, this is a birch that you can pretty much put anywhere. And the reason we love the gray birch from a landscape standpoint is it doesn't get big, usually gets about 12 to 15 feet tall and forms a nice little delicate white stripe in the landscape in terms of its aesthetic features. So it's really a birch that can be worked into almost any size landscape, unlike the river birch, which does get big enough what, that it's a little too big for certain landscapes. So the gray birch is kind of a diminutive slender birch and the popular folia name just means that it has cottonwood like leaves, as you can see in the photo. Red maple, I think a lot of people know the red maple. However, um, people may not realize that you know, it, it's not that abundant right where we live here in the Finger Lakes. Um, it seems to have localized preferences for soil conditions, maybe pH, I'm not really sure. You see more of it in the Adirondacks, you see more of it uh, on certain, in certain parts of the region. We have a lot of sugar maple locally here in Hugo Lake area. Um, and I wish we had a little more red maple sometimes in the fall when, when we're seeing pictures of red fall color everywhere else. But the red maple is known for being a fairly adaptable tree in the landscape trade, more so than the sugar maple. And because it's smaller than the silver maple, which is another native maple around here, it's used a lot in landscapes because it's smaller and it's more versatile, more adaptable to soils and light conditions. Um, it doesn't really seem to grow as fast or as vigorously as people sometimes want it to, but it does seem to survive in almost any condition. So it's a great way to get some diversity in the tree layer. And the bottom right is just to show you that when we don't select for certain things like fall color, we can actually get lots of great fall color from seedlings as long as we don't only want red. Cottonwood, I know it's hard to get people to plant cottonwoods and a lot of people curse them when they have them on their properties, but cottonwoods are gigantic Eastern United States native trees abundant in the Finger Lakes and all over central New York. And looking at the trees there for scale, on the photo on the left are some children of mine. And photo on the right, you can see a little barbecue grill at the base of the right side trunk there to give you a scale on the size of these trees. These are enormous cottonwoods at Myers Park in Lansing. And a tree like that does what nothing else can do in terms of deep stabilization for soil along a waterway along a water body. So ideally we would have big trees, small trees, large shrubs, small shrubs, and then a diverse perennial layer on the ground. But since this is a park, 
Um, we don't have all that. In this case, it's a highly recreationally used park. So it's mostly big trees and lawn. And thank goodness that the trees are still there. And I know the people who run this park obviously appreciate the trees, but it's, it, it would be nice to see those trees reproducing. Uh, and at this point, I don't think they are. And then one other tree just to show you the sycamore. It's a great wetland tree. These aren't really great photos on the left, but I couldn't resist including it because it's showing you how the sycamore really lives in the water environment. So uh, this is a tree that we can plant in a waterway or alongside a waterway. And you're literally seeing in that photo how a big root system of a native tree provides various functional values, keeps the water cleaner by holding back the bank, keeps the bank there in the first place, which provides habitat for other plants to grow. And then of course, we hope that the plants that grow there aren't just honeysuckles and buckthorns and all the other junk, which often is the case, but we can't blame that on the trees. Um, Platinus is a great tree and um, they're fast growing. So when they're used on restoration projects, they're rewarding because they're fast growing. And there's just a look at some of the winter effects of the sycamore too. Uh, I guess one more tree, white pine, just because we get so many requests for evergreen trees, so many requests. And, you know, the spruces that are in the landscape trade aren't really native here. So, you know, blue spruce is generally Colorado blue spruce. Norway spruce, not a native tree. Uh, most of the evergreens you see planted are not native. Hemlocks aren't really planted much anymore because of the woolly adelgid and they're fussy in the landscape environment. White pine is kind of the, our last um, hope for incorporating evergreen trees into the landscape or really evergreen plants at all, because we really don't have evergreen shrubs in central New York for the most part um, that can be applied to these situations and expected to do well and grow fast. That's not really how they work. So the white pine is kind of our only evergreen to incorporate into this concept of using native plants and finding the ones that work well and grow pretty fast. And they do grow pretty quickly. Um, so we try to encourage people to use them, but most people like spruces and, you know, I won't get into that here. But I think most of you know the white pine. Just a couple other, a couple of quick plants here. I'm not going to show any perennials today because I, we don't have time to go through that. That's sort of a whole other thing. Is the long list of native forbs and perennials that are applicable in projects. But I think most people know those more than they know the trees and shrubs. And that's why I wanted to focus on woody plants today. But I had to show a couple of vines. I love the Virginia creeper. I'm, I always hear people talk about it like it's a weed and they want to get it out of a property. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, I, I understand maybe weeding it out of a bed in the front of front yard or in the front foundation landscape, but um, in, in a natural landscape or in a natural environment on a creek, um, in the types of projects that we're talking about, this plant is a, this plant is a blessing. Um, it's a, just a fruit factory for everything that eats these cute little fruits. Um, it grows in shade or sun. It'll grow wet or dry. This plant is, is a vigorous coverage plant. It will, it will climb structures, as you can see. It will um, stabilize soil. It will grow on steep slopes. The picture in the upper left is taken from the rim of the Taganic Falls waterfall, looking down at the trail that leads up to Taganic, where you can see uh, the falls from. And those large green stripes that are running down the gorge bowl there, those are Virginia creeper and a couple of other species, but most of what's there is Virginia creeper. So these are just specific examples to show you how useful and functional and um, amazing these plants can be when placed in a habitat where they're at home and where they're needed. That's really the key. And on top of all their structural and stabilizing functions, the fact that this plant produces just uh, you know, a, a, a buffet of delicious little fruits for mammals and birds is, that's the bonus with that plant. And it'll do it in the shade. Uh, last vine to show you is just uh, our native clematis. It's another plant where we get lots of requests for people wanting to grow the big showy purple flowered ones. And those are cute. I like those plants. They're fun when you see them. But I wouldn't use them in these types of projects that we're talking about because we have this clematis, which is native here, which is easy to seed collect locally. 
You can see in the left, it grows on mine tailings. This is in Jamesville near Syracuse. This is growing on mine tailings. Bulletproof plant, full sun, no water, and it's basically forming a, attempting to form a ground cover in rock. And on the upper right, you're seeing a, a late season look of the seed heads in a swamp in Dryden near, near Ithaca. So you're seeing it in growing in two completely different phases and habitats, which tells us that this plant is incredibly versatile. And that tells us to use it for those reasons. And then we also have to remember that it's a beautiful plant. The first two photos I'm pointing to are not the most beautiful looks for that plant, but you see it in flower and in seed in the lower photo. And it's a clematis, they're beautiful plants. I mean, if you ask it to grow on mine tailings, it's not going to show itself off maybe as well as if you put it on a fence on the back of your property. And it's also, like many native flowering plants, a great source of pollen and nectar or, uh, for pollinators. And then I couldn't resist one perennial showing people milkweeds, just mainly because I love to um, share the story that for years and years and years, when I first was growing plants, I tried to grow milkweeds and none of the, I tried to sell them to garden centers. This is when I lived in California. Nobody was interested. They didn't really get what we were doing. They didn't understand why we were growing milkweeds. And we told them, well, it's for the monarch butterflies. And they said, well, you know, maybe come back next year, we'll see. And we could not give those plants away. And we actually did give some away to a butterfly uh, breeder because he needed leaves to feed his caterpillars. So that was basically what we grew them for at that time. 25, 30 years later now, we're growing them in the nursery and we grow several species of native milkweeds and it's very hard to keep them in stock because people have come around and they've gotten the whole milkweed thing and it's awesome. Milkweeds are deer proof and they're the only host plant for the monarch butterfly, but they're also great pollinator plants when they're in flower. There's a wide, wide range of pollinators that come visit the flowers when the milkweed is blooming. So that's not a host specific feature of milkweeds. That's a generic service they provide to lots of pollinators, their flowers. It's only the host relationship with the monarch is that the monarch only lays its eggs on milkweed plants so that its caterpillars can eat, its larvae can eat milkweed leaves and pick up the toxins that are in the milkweed plants. And that's how those monarchs are protected from predation. They carry this poison in their system from the milkweed plant. But the rest of the plant, the flowering, is all just a generically uh, happy pollinator plant that feeds lots and lots of species. And that same toxicity is that protects the monarch is what makes the milkweed deer proof. So that's a nice combination of traits. When we grow these in the nursery, which we do from seed, we collect seed and we grow them from seed. This is always a plant we grow from seed, um, local seed. We get monarch caterpillars devouring their, the leaves of these plants when the plants are like three months old. Sometimes we have to you know, move them around from plant to plant because they'll, they'll even come when the plants sometimes only have two sets of new leaves from the beginning. So once they reach a certain size, we're happy to let the monarchs defoliate if they can, if they want to. Um, of course, we are a non-spray nursery. I want to make that clear to people. We do not spray for insects. We do not treat. We do not chemically treat for insects or bugs or um, uh, fungus gnats. We don't treat. We don't use chemicals to treat our plants. That's not something we do in the nursery. And our plants are really healthy because of it. They're vigorous. They're big. I've spent many years in the nursery industry, and I always believed that the constant barrage of chemicals in the nursery industry was was not only bad for everything, but also wasn't good for the plants. And we've seen that every year in our nursery that plants are healthy and vigorous. And I think a part of that is because we're not bombarding them with junk all the time. And when you see little monarchs, caterpillars in the nursery, I mean, you'd, you'd have to be a cold hearted person to spray your plants at that point. So that's the nursery angle. I'm gonna give you the world's fastest nursery tour here because it's two o'clock and we just have three slides. Just trying to show you a couple of things about nursery production of native plants. The left is an elderberry seedling. We do all of our, um, with our native plants, we try to grow all of them from seed. We don't always get to do that. If we don't get a good seed crop, can't collect it or they don't come up. But we try to grow as many of our native species from locally collected seed as possible. And that's what the yellow tags are in our nursery. 
is it yellow tag in that photo you can see them there that it means it's a local seed source plant we've grown that plant that crop from a local seed elderberry on the left with the roots washed clean so you can see the structure that's a one-year-old elderberry from seed and then on the bottom right is a one-year-old iris in the plug trays and then the left the photo in the middle is probably a second year iris blue flag iris native iris versicolor in a six inch pot so those are vigorous growers from seed and then just a quick note about our signage that i want people to understand we try to make sure people get information about these plants if you're interested in native plants you're not getting information from proven winners tags and you're not really getting it from the American Beauties tags, and you're not getting it from all those branded plant lines that the garden centers are trying to sell. It's just, that's the deal. So we're trying to make sure people get as much information as they need to make decisions about plants in their garden. So when they come to the nursery, they can see our signage, you get hardiness zone, you get the geography of the plant, where it's native, growth rates, type of plant, moisture requirements, any other features, light requirements, that's the information you should be getting at every nursery and every garden center and unfortunately that's not the case um so i appreciate everybody uh tuning in and i'm happy to answer questions and we'll see how many we can get to on our um q a and also uh if anyone has questions later and needs to follow up or with anything you can always go to our website which is here and shoot an email to me there i'm happy to answer any questions I'm just, I see Dorothy has her hand up and I'm not sure what I should do, but let me see how that goes. There we go. All right. Um, we're in q and I don't know exactly how to call on someone who's got a hand raised. Let me see how to do that. I don't know if you know how to do that, Jen. I am not seeing. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, let, me, let me answer. I'm going to just quickly, before I do uh, hand raises, let me just take a quick look at the Q&A questions because I know they were coming in throughout and I just want to see specifically uh, what those are. And I'm going to answer some of these really quickly on the Q&A. So one is from Carol Beesmeyer, which is a great comment, which is about cultivars, that cultivars do not always have the same traits as the regular straight species of a plant. And very often those traits are the ones pollinators need. That could be that the reproductive parts that make pollen or nectar are not active and not um, functional on a cultivar. It could mean that a plant actually is made to be sterile uh, so that it becomes a seedless form and doesn't spread. You could also just, <laughs> excuse me, you could have timing issues where a cultivar doesn't have the same timing as a native species in its native habitat. Uh, so Jim Long is asking about specific native plants that might be bulletproof and also support one caterpillar or another. Big, big topic, lots of detail goes into that. It's hard to answer the, that question. Uh, one example would be like the native Lindera benzoin which is the larval host for the spice bush swallowtail. However, I don't know that I would call Lindera benzoin quite bulletproof. Um, it's versatile and it's somewhat deer proof. It's definitely deer resistant. It's got a strong medicinal odor to it. So it's definitely somewhat deer resistant. It's not quite as bulletproof as something like great dogwood though, I would say. Um, Judy uh, asked, could you expand on why miscanthus grass is on the do not plant list? Is it invasive, but does it cause harm? Good question. Um, the idea with the do not plant list is pretty much that they're just looking at which species are invasive in other parts of the country and using that as some predictor for what might be invasive here. I do not generally see miscanthus being invasive now in central New York but it might be in the future because we know it's invasive. It's somewhere as close as let's say Maryland. The issue with does it cause harm is that it, it displaces other plants. It displaces other plants spatially. Um, and it's also an opportunity cost. Whenever a, a, a non-native plant is living somewhere, then a native plant isn't living there. 
it, it raises the bigger question of how and why we preserve native habitat in the first place. That's a big topic, which I'd probably defer to another, another presentation. Um, is there a beetle problem with pines? Can it be controlled? Pine, all the evergreens have beetle problems, they do. Um, can it be controlled? Probably not. I don't think it's gonna wipe out white pines the way woolly adelgid is trying to wipe out hemlocks or the ash borer is trying to wipe out ash. Pines have beetle problems and they generally live through that. Um, I'll go through a few more of these as quickly as I can. Is that okay with you, Jen? All right. Milkweed, common milkweed that just grows near a small pond. It will grow a while, but then looks sickly yellow and dies. Why would it do that? Um, not sure if it is the common milkweed. I have seen that. I don't know if they get a virus. It's possible that it might be getting some kind of virus that's turning it yellow. You know, I don't really do much with plant pathology. I generally take the approach that we want plants that are disease resistant naturally. Um, I would say overall, the common milkweed is very disease resistant naturally. And I don't know why I'm in that spot, it's not happy, but it might be that it's too wet. That's one thing that plant doesn't really love. Uh, cold stratifying milkweed seeds I collected in my neighborhood. How do I know if they are Asclepius? All milkweeds are Asclepius. Asclepius is the Latin name, is the botanic name for milkweed. So the question would be which one you have. And if you collected it in like a roadside environment in a field, it's probably the common milkweed. And if you collected it right around the pond edge or somewhere wet, it's probably the swamp milkweed. Those are by far the two common ones we see. Um, quince shrubs, native to the Finger Lakes. No, they are not. They're not a native plant. Um, a fun plant, but not native. Uh, pawpaw, we have little baby ones that were growing in the nursery. Juniperus virginiana as a native evergreen is a good to use. It's a great plant. The reason I don't highlight it is it is not bulletproof. It gets deer browsed and it is very prone to um, fungal problems and rust. So it's very hard to keep uh, ju native junipers happy in the nursery. That's one of the reasons you rarely see them sold by nurseries is because they really don't last when they're grown in containers. They just suffer from fungal problems and rust. And so it's not a great forecast for them being used too much. Um, we do have a few in the nursery that are ball and burlap, but I try to discourage people from using them, honestly, unless they're really confident or they don't mind trial and error. I'm gonna skip the other quince question, sorry. Um, native evergreen small shrub for a small yard. Uh, I kind of say there's no such thing. I mean, down in the mid-Atlantic people use Ilex glabra, which is a broadleaf evergreen native holly. So it's got nice little round leaves like that big. And it's a holly and it's native and it's evergreen. But up here, honestly, I almost never see that plant looking good because it wants to grow where the cleffer grows, which is like acidic sands along the coast. So you can try it, but there's really no such thing as an easy to grow native evergreen small shrub. That's just not where we live, I'm sorry to say. Um, let's see, uh, one more milkweed question. <laughs> uh, I planted common milkweed in my yard. It's coming up everywhere, a couple hundred. How can I share these best with others by rhizome? It's pretty hard to dig them up. You wouldn't think it would be, but they're really deep. And the best thing you could do to try to dig some of those up is really just shovel dig them deeper than you think and go big around them, like a big circle around them and get them in the ground really quickly and water them and hope. But that's why we grow them from seed because they're so easy from seed that it's much easier than trying to do them from divisions or rhizo. Um, Jen, you just cut me off whenever you want. Uh, okay. Keep going, we still have plenty of people tuned in. So okay. keep, it, keep it up. Uh, beware of pale swallowwort, an aggressive milkweed look-alike invasive. Yes, widespread in the Rochester area, widespread in the Finger Lakes. It's in all the parks now. It's all around the, the Fuga Lake shore. It's everywhere. Uh, the swallowwort is, uh, it has a tall, slender milkweed looking seed head, but the, but the width of the seed head is only like a centimeter. So it, once you look closely, you'll know it's not the same plant. 
Um, but people should just pull that up online, pull up swallow wort online, learn the plant, make sure you don't try to grow that as a milkweed because it's definitely not, it's not native and it's highly invasive. And there's issues with monarchs actually sometimes laying eggs on swallow wort. And I don't think that's good for the butterflies. I don't think they get the same thing from it. Uh, what makes burning bush an invasive species? I mean, really what makes an invasive species is that it's not native and it tends to spread from the place it's planted out into the wild. That's pretty much the definition of, a of an invasive species. So, <laughs> you know, you may not see it behaving as an invasive species where you live, but generally, if a plant is relegated to the category of invasive species, it's based on lots of data over a large spatial scale that the plant does do that. And, you know, whatever, I, 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 I mean, I, that's a plant I don't like. I mean, I say I like all plants, but, you know, that's one I don't really like. Um, it's not a plant's fault that it's invasive. So I, it's not really to say that a plant is good or bad. It's just important that people understand what happens in the landscape out in the wild when plants get out of hand. And if you ever go past the Catskills on Route 17, you'll see barberry growing in the woods of the Catskills where it doesn't belong. And so, you know, that's track record that it gives justification for a plant being um, considered invasive. Um, some of the specific questions I'm seeing here about like specific plant spacings, um, like for, for example, using Virginia creeper on a steep slope, how far apart would you plant them where the client wants vinca? Um, that's, a good, that's a good example of a real life landscape headache is clients that wanna use a plant that you don't wanna use. And the reality is your plant isn't really analogous. So Virginia creeper is not evergreen and vinca is. So I don't like vinca and I don't use it, but I can understand if a client says, well, we, like a, we want an evergreen ground cover. Do you have a native one? It's tricky. Um, again, you look around, go hiking in our woods. When, what do you see that's evergreen on the ground? Not too much. Uh, some of the ferns. So, you know, like Christmas ferns sometimes, but it's not really evergreen. It just doesn't fully break down until the next year. So uh, it's tricky, but I think if you want to try to use those plants, it's important to be realistic with clients and make sure they know isn't the same plant and it's not even almost the same. It's an alternative. It's not a replacement that you're going to be fooled by. It's an alternative. And I would put, you know, I'd say if, if the client has a budget for it and you can use some small Virginia creepers, I'd put them a foot apart. But if they have patience, you know, you can plant them four feet on center and let them grow in and grow together. Um, it, it, the, those, that's a tricky one, but it's a good question. Um, we could do a whole presentation on alternatives to the, to those plants, um, but what's tricky about it is that uh, they're just not the same thing, and it's important to make sure people know that, that you're not talking about the same plant. Um, trying to find now, get back to the hand raises. There we go. Let me just see if we got a few. Um, as long as people can keep uh, questions quick, let's try. Some of these, Dorothy. Do I have to unmute Dorothy for that, Jen? Sorry, you answered my question. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you, Dorothy. And how about, let's see, uh, Mary. Uh, Mary, I think you're, Mary Kelly, I think you're muted. And if you don't want to ask your question, that's okay. I'm all set. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, Mark, Mark. If you don't want to ask your question, that's okay. We can go back to a couple of written ones or we could wrap it up. All right, he's got his hand down. I'll skip the hand raises. Um, and if it, uh, we'll take, one, let's see, we'll take one last look. And uh, anyone, if you want, you can always email us through the website um, as far as questions or uh, follow-ups to questions that we're dealing with here. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that I think it's important, I just want to make sure people understand is that 
we're, we're talking about growing things from seed and from local seed source and using these plants in local projects. And it's a hard thing to do. It's not, you know, people often ask us, well, is there someone doing that where I live or somewhere else? And it's hard. It's hard to get people to do it. It's not, it's not the um, path of least resistance in the nursery business. You know, the alternative to what we do is a lot of large scale garden centers getting all their plants delivered once a week on a huge truck from a huge wholesale grower in Oklahoma or Virginia or something like that. And so all the work of growing the plants is now removed from the garden center's burden. And all they have to do is put them on the shelf and they sell. So that's what we're up against. And that's what you're up against too. Cause when you're looking for plants of a different type and that plants that come from a different um, process and pipeline, there's just not that many people that do it. There are some, and unfortunately a lot of them have gravitated towards the wholesale market where they basically want to grow huge numbers of plants for large scale projects. And that's what we've been trying to do to keep ourselves in this weird niche where we grow sort of a wholesale style in the nursery, but we make them available to people, to the public. It's kind of, in some ways, a terrible business model, but, um, but it, we've been doing it long enough that it's become a better business model and it's working and, you know, it's, it's different. And we, we're, we're doing it for those reasons that we're talking about today. And I appreciate everybody um, hanging around and paying attention. And uh, thank you to Ed and Nancy and Jen too for uh, putting it all together. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. We're so grateful that you were with us. Um, and thanks everyone for, for hanging in here to the end. Um, again, this session was recorded. We'll let you know when that link is available online so you can go back and review. Um, if you have any questions, feel free, as Dan said, to reach out to him, contact us at the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network, or feel free to visit the Finger Lakes Regional Watershed Alliance website for um, a list of the rest of the programs throughout this week. We have a program tonight on aquatic invasive species, a couple programs tomorrow, and then our final program on Friday. There was a question about Friday's program. Uh, one of the presenters was confirmed um, just recently. And so you'll see information on that Friday keynote and a link to register should be by later this afternoon. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.